Okay, so first of all, thanks for all the organizers for uh, having me here. This is a, an amazing seminar that I have been following up, I think, since May that started. And it's a great opportunity to present this kind of work. So, so I'm very happy. Okay, and now I think now you're seeing my screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so as, as I was telling you, today I will present a, an important a paper that deals about the labor market impacts of the Venezuelans in, in Colombia. Okay, so I will try to, to be on time with all the results I have. So I will try to be quick some part. In some parts, I will be take some more time. Okay, so the, first of all, the content of the presentation, uh, I will begin with a, a little bit of the introduction about this Venezuelan crisis, show you some descriptive statistics, then some literature that deals about this topic and, and get to know more about uh, this phenomenon uh, that is going on. Then I will focus on, on my empirical, empirical strategy that will be a combination of a, an event study design in, where, in which uh, I get advantage of the um, different local labor markets in Colombia that I also combine with a shift shared instrumental variable. Then I will show you some, some results, different set of results, and some, some remarks that I think are good about these, these topics. And if I have time, then I will show you some robustness checks that I did in, in this analysis. The first, uh, my, my main research question is, uh, do Venezuelan immigrants reduce wages and employment of Colombians? This is like the big question I want to answer with this paper. And I have different nice setups, uh, setups that uh, help me with um, analyzing this topic. The first one is that there is a, a nice uh, quasi-natural experiment that is driven by the unprecedented uh, economic and social crisis from Venezuela that has caused massive uh, flows of people leaving the country. So it's something like uh, specific from Venezuela that only indirectly uh, affects Colombia. Also, I focus on Colombia because this is the, by far the biggest destination country of Venezuelans. I will show you some data, but the numbers are quite high. Also, because there's a differential intensity of the Venezuelan arrivals within Colombia, I can exploit the event study design, that is the comparison of different local labor markets. And also I use two different instruments uh, to complement this event study design. And lastly, I use a recent population census that was done in the country that can help with the to reduce this measurement error that can uh, arise with the, the measure of migrants that we know that in a standard survey that this can attenuate the bias of the estimates. Okay, so with this uh, basic uh, introduction, I'm gonna go jump uh, to the preview of the results for some of the people that just have 10 or, or five minutes to see it. So I find that a one percentage point increase in the share of employed Venezuelans causes on average a reduction in, nat in native hourly wages of 1.6 and 1.7%, that is a, a big uh, reduction. Then I'm gonna compare with uh, the literature uh, how these results fit. Also this decrease in native hourly wages is accompanied by an increase in, in native weekly working hours. So natives are, uh, wages are reducing, but the working hours are increasing. So this can be like an effect that can come with this. And also I find a reduction in, in native employment of between 1.5 and 1.5% that is almost like a one-to-one -one, uh, displacement. It's not entirely like that. I'm gonna explain you later, but uh, there is a, a huge also effect on employment. Also, because this, uh, I study an event study design, I can, I can show you the dynamic treatment effects and we can see that the first there is a wage response and then second is an employment response that is uh, similar to what the literature has found. And another thing, interesting thing of this setup is that uh, the labor market of Colombia is a segment, segmented one. Okay, so we have like two types of labor markets. One that is formal where there is a compliance with the social security system and one that is informal where you don't have it. Okay, so this, this type of, of interactions that normally you don't have in developed countries is something additional that you have to study in this type of uh, immigration shock. So I, I show that when you do the division between formal and informal workers, there is a, a striking differences. Okay, so the first one is for informal workers. There is a, a clearly negative wage response that is accompanied with a corresponding positive, positive impact on employment. And also uh, on formal workers, I find no effects on wages. Okay, so something important is that for formal workers, uh, you, have, you know that there's a binding minimum wage. Okay, so there is a price ceiling that is making that the wage flexibility is, is uh, smaller than for informal workers. Okay, so this is like my main results and I will try to explain now briefly uh, all about this. First one, uh, uh, 
Firstly, in terms of specification, I have some related literature. So the first studies of immigration that consistent of the comparison of, of areas that uh, lately was called the spatial approach. You have a uh, paper that just the identification of, of those papers was the normal parallel trend assumption. That means that if treated areas will have not received the influx of migrants, outcomes will behave similarly between treated and non-treated areas. So this is something basic that we know from the standard difference in difference uh, estimation. But now most recent studies on this spatial approach uh, are based on a combination of a yearly difference in differences with instrumental variable. Okay, so I'm gonna focus mainly on these two papers. One, this one of Dossmann that's, that analyzes the, the impact of Czech workers on the Bavarian region of Germany. And also this paper of Ido that analyze, analyzes the effect of repatriates of, 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 Fran of French people in France. Okay, now in this case, the identification now requires something a little, more, a little bit more, ex, um, like let's say, complicated. That is a parallel trend assumption with, with IB. And a suggestive test that is normally used in the literature is the flat pretrend uh, uh, that you uh, see in the event study graphs. Okay. Now, if we focus on the Colombian context, this, this topic, of course, is, is, has been a study. And there's uh, only one published paper, and it finds that the Venezuelan immigration has had a very large negative effect. So it's something quite substantive. And in this case, the empirical specification that they use is a, is a pooled regression where all periods get stuck. And also they use an instrumental variable of distance. That is um, an instrumental variable similar to the one I use in my paper. In this case, one of the issues is that the parameter of interest is a static. Okay, so I'm gonna show you that migration is increasing on time. And if you type, if you, use an, an static parameter, you might be capturing a lot of effects in that estimation. Okay, and also the pretrends in this case in this case are only verified at the historical level. They don't have so much recent pretreatment data. And this could be can be a bias on the estimates that they found. On the other hand, there are two most recent unpublished papers and they found the opposite. They found insignificant estimates on wages. Okay, so when, I see, when you see these results, you can think why are they so different if they use the same data set, the three of them use the same data set, that is the labor for survey of Colombia. Okay, I'm at the end of the paper, I'm gonna show you why I think they are, they're the results so different. And this is one of the motivations also of this paper to try to uh, find the prevailing effect that this immigration event has had on the Colombian labor market. Okay, now in, <clears throat> now in terms of data, I'm, I'm gonna use two uh, data sets. The first one is the same as them, is the labor for survey of Colombia that is representative for 24 areas or departments that is going to be my, my area of analysis. These surveys are repeated cross section. There is no panel component. So this is, is also a, a problem that a limitation that this has. And we ha I have monthly information from 2013 to 2019. So almost six years of information. And I combine this information of the labor for survey with the census in 2018, um, that's of course this is a census, so I have all the information in, in the country. And I and one important thing is that for both data sets, it is possible to identify migrant and native population because I have a question of, of country of birth. Okay, so it's it, this is important because I can distinguish which kind of effects are going and which for which type of, of population. And of course, the additional uh, instruments that I use in the estimation, I use uh, more information that I will, I will show you uh, later. Okay, so briefly, so the recent uh, timeline of the Venezuelan crisis, I think it's something well known. Uh, in 2013, as Nicolás Maduro stepped as a president when Hugo Chavez died, so there was an inexistent private sector and basically the government depended uh, only on the, on the revenues from, from the petroleum. Okay, uh, from the oil prices. Okay, and then you can in 2015. So there's uh, more problems, but oil pr oil prices dropped half. So the government of Venezuela lost the only source of revenue, and this led to decrease in social funding and programs, and this generates social discontent. And more 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 and more, the society of Venezuela was falling down for different uh, type of of reasons that I'm not going to specify in here. But moreover, in 2017, there was a, an elections in an state elections in Venezuela, where the party of Maduro won the majority of them, 
with uh, apparent uh, things of fraud, and then he gained full power over Venezuela and the three branches of, of the government. And these, uh, the signs of, of a fleeing uh, dictatorship was very clear, and this ignited more and more um, types of migration from the country. So a last measure in 2018 from the IMF uh, stated that the Venezuela reached a five digit per inflation, almost 65,000. And in 2018, the GDP decreased by minus 34%. Okay, so the reasons from immigration from Venezuela are several. There is a political crisis, an economic crisis. There are price controls, in, uh, uh, trade restrictions. The Bolivar currency is unexistent. So we have a lot of problems that are making that people are going more and more to other countries. Then if, if we try to measure this phenomenon using the, 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 the survey that I use from Colombia, you see that from 2013, that is when, when the measure started, there's an, an a steady um, non-movement of Venezuelans. But then after 2016 and 17, there is an, an exponential increase of, of Venezuelans. And of course, by the reasons I have, I have told to you, in this case, because the, the event study, I need to take a base period of analysis of comparison. I'm gonna take one full year, okay, for to remove seasonality effects. I'm gonna take the year of 2015, and I'm gonna compare this 2015 with the pre-treatment years and post-treatment years to see what is the effect of Venezuela. And to see also the heterogeneity that you have in the different areas. So if you go to panel B, the, the graph in panel B, you see there is a, a big heterogeneity, okay? So some departments are receiving a quite a amount of migrants while others not so much. So this is very uh, interesting because this can give us um, more uh, better results for, for our analysis. And then if you focus on the location of these Venezuelan immigrants uh, using the census, that is the, the, the census is the more precise information of, of Venezuelans. You see that Venezuela is over here where I'm putting, where I'm pointing. And these X are crossing bridges, are the most famous crossing bridges in, in Colombia. And you see that those departments are the ones that in, in, in relative terms has the most amounts of migrants. And as you move farther away, you found less migrants. So this is, I think, one of the reasons that the distance instrument is, is very used in this kind of uh, setups. May I just ask you a clarification question for this? Yeah, is yeah. Just from a point of view of somebody that knows just a little bit Colombia. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, is my impression that the area that is close to Venezuela is probably also a very rural, so a lot of forest and, and jungle. Yes. Uh, so are there many jobs there, especially in the in the formal sector? Uh, I don't I don't think so. What happens is that you have like three main crossing bridges and you have a lot of, of illegal crossing bridges. OK, so mm -hmm. of course, there's a lot of, um, let's say, jungle over there, but there is also businesses. But the majority of businesses are not formal ones, are most informal ones, because are, are a type of businesses that are not registered on, on any kind of, of tax record. And they are only, uh, I think, on demand. Okay, so if, depending on the amount of migrants, they open or not. So it's, I think it's a highly uh, informal uh, border, also rural one. And only in the big cities, you, you th I see, I think that there is like the effect of, of, of these crossings. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. So, <clears throat> okay, so you appreciate that the majority, of course, the, 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 the border is, is huge. No, I, I didn't plot Venezuela, but it goes really, really down. It's, 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 a, it's more than 2,000 kilometers of, of terrestrial frontier. Okay, so now if, if I show you some labor market statistics differentiating between Colombians and, and Venezuelans, okay, so I have a lot of numbers. But let's, let's focus on unemployment. So this is the rate of employment. And one important thing that you appreciate is that the rate of employment of Venezuelans is, is higher than, than of Colombians. And this is like, a, we can explain this fact by, by the fact that the labor uh, supply of Venezuelans, it, it could be more inelastic. And in that sense, they, they have lower reservation weights that, wages that could mean a higher employment rates. So this is something that you also so found in the literature. And the other interesting thing is that in here, I'm making the distinction between in informal. So this is the informal rate. That is the amount of occupied workers, how many of them are informal. And you, as you can see, in Colombia, informality is something where the majority of workers are. And I have two definitions. One of them is informal, and, one, and the other one is, is informal social security. 
The first one of this informal is, is a definition based on firm size and occupation that is more a national definition. And the informal social security is just if the worker is affiliated to social security or not. So it's most basic and more comparable uh, between countries. So I'm gonna use this definition of social security later in my analysis, but I also gonna uh, in the robustness, uh, the, the runness the checks, I also show that the results are also similar for this. But one important thing I wanted to show you is that the informal social security for Venezuelans, as you can see, the majority of them are working on this sector. In 2019, uh, almost 90% of Venezuelan workers were not affiliated to the social security system. Okay, so the supply shock has been mainly absorbed by this, by this sector. And if you go to, to the density of wages, I just wanted to show you that there is a huge uh, bunching around the minimum wage for the formal sector. So this is the reason I was telling you that the minimum wage really acts as a binding constraint for the formal workers. And that's, that could be one of the reasons that we don't see or I don't see any a formal a effect on any effect on formal wages, but we're gonna do with more detail later. Okay, now if we if we turn to the empirical strategy, so my preferred specification, as I told you, is an, an event study one where you can think as a difference in difference where, where I have an outcome for a given department. And here I'm focusing on the department or area level for uh, for the the T subscript. I have a, um, an area and time fixed effects and my parameter of interest will be the interaction between this MD 2018, that is my treatment variable or migration rate and a time and a time subscript, okay? And in this case, the omitted year, the, the year I'm gonna make those comparison is 2015 as I, as I told you before. The interesting thing is I'm, I'm having a, a, a variable that is fixed on time, so, is fixed on time because I take it for the census and I, the idea is I, I took this variable from the census because I want to deal with this possible measurement error that can come from the survey. And the idea is that this migration rate is just taking the amount of employed Venezuelans in 2018 in a given department D minus the amount of Venezuelans in 2015 in a given department D, okay? so. And the denominator is just waiting by the total amount of employee population, Venezuelans plus Colombians in 2018. Okay, so one problem of using this fixed in time migration rate is, is the interpretation of the coefficients of the year different than 2018. So in this case, I'm trying to focus in only on 2018 coefficients and, and, and the other ones are just for, um, to see more or less the, the, the trends, okay? Um, Okay, so if anyone has, has any questions, just please, please interrupt. Moreover, I also can transform this equation one into a difference, uh, differences regression to use as an explanatory variable, not the fixing time only from the census, but this time varying that you see that this subscript T is not, not now only 2018, but I have different T's. And this one is coming from the census, uh, from, sorry, from HH survey. Okay, so this one is not from the census, this one is from the survey, and from the survey I have yearly information. So I can also use this empirical specification to test how similar are the results, and if I want to interpret directly the different post-treatment coefficients, I can use this one. With the caveat that you know that this could be the, the, the measurement error we have discussing about, so I'm trying to be somehow a, a not so confident of, of, this, of this rate. But anyways, it is the same definition as before. I'm just taking the differences between the total employed population in a given year minus the, the base year. And in this case, the denominator is in fact waiting by the population in 2015 in the, in the base period. Because with the survey, I, can, I have all the differentiations in the, all the information in the different uh, years. Okay, so I have these two types of, of, of specifications um, and I use them for the, for the analysis. Okay, so, uh, what else I'm doing? I'm adding a, an instrumental variable approach. Why? If migrants self-select into areas where the economic conditions are better, this migration rate can be endogenous, okay? So the idea is that I use two exogenous shares to, to construct two additional instruments. The first one is the most common in the literature that is a, a past settlement instrument that is just based on, on past uh, settlements of Venezuelans 
to predict new settlements of Venezuela. So in this case, I'm using the census of 2005 and I'm calculating the share of Venezuelans in a given state in 2005. And I'm normalizing by the amount of total employed population in, in the previous year, okay, as, 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 as Carl did. One thing I did with this instrument, I also show in the robustness checks that if I use a more lagged uh, shares from 1973 and 1993, the results are more or less similar, okay? So this is a, can be threats to identify an assumption if previous uh, economic trends are still correlated to current ones. So that's the reason I'm using, try to use farther away. But with, with this 2005, it, it's working fine. And the second one is, is a typical distance instrument that uh, they use in, in the Caruso uh, paper and also in this paper by Del Carpio and Wagner, they use this distance instrument. So the idea of this distance instrument is this T um, variable is just measuring the distance in kilometers between cities in Colombia and cities in Venezuela. And this lambda uh, is just giving a weight to that city in Venezuela if more people are coming from there. So I, I have a measure of from where people are coming from Venezuela. So I'm just giving a weight to the cities that more people are, go, are coming from there. Okay, so the idea is that uh, not all the distance is, is measured equally, but I'm giving more weights to cities where more people are coming. Okay, so these are my two instruments that I use uh, in the analysis. I don't combine them, I just use, use them separately and I try to, to compare all the results. Okay, so the, the, first, uh, the first stage of, of this instrument with this migration rate from the census, as you can see from this equation uh, seven, uh, you see that the distance instrument, the, the variation in the distance instrument explains 88% of the variation in the migration rate. So it's, it's a, a FS statistics quite high, uh, while the, the past settlement instrument is all more or less 50%. And the F F F statistics is more or less 37. Okay, so both instruments are well predictors of this uh, migration rate. And then uh, I will go. I will go to the results. Okay, so in the results, the first thing to note is that the flat free trends it seems to to be okay because they are not not insignificant. But one thing, if you go to the OLS, that is this gray uh, gray uh, estimate is larger in size than compared to YB. So it seems that migrants are going to areas with rising wages and that it, it seems to be corrected by the instrument I'm using, specifically by the past settlement instrument. Okay, and then if you go to the post-treatment coefficients, so, so you see that it, uh, it gets uh, the opposite. Okay, so now the, the estimate is lower for the OLS, indicated that it could be an omitted variable bias. And then this is, let's say corrected by the both instruments. So you can see that in 2016, it seems that the estimates are, are uh, null estimates, but then in all the post years, focus on the IB ones are, um, are negative. And, as, and the magnitude I was telling to you at the beginning is only from, is from the 2018 coefficient. That is the one I focus because the migration rate is from 2018. Okay, so in this case, you find, I, I find that, um, a one percentage point increase in the migration rate. I just explained to you, increases uh, decreases native because this is focusing on native of Colombians, native hourly wages between 1.6 and 1.7%, 1.7%. And also both coefficients are kind of similar, both coefficients of the two instruments. Okay, so this is my, my first uh, main result. And I wanted to compare like with what the literature has found so the first thing um, I, I found is for similar papers, I try to focus on similar papers for a one percentage point that has a similar definition of migration rate. I find that for a one percentage point increase, uh, AXU that they focus on the impact of the Syrian refuge, uh, refugees on the Turkish uh, labor market. They found es insignificant estimates on Turkish wages, but of course, if they do the, the difference between informal and formal ones, they found that for the informal sector is negative, while for the formal sector is positive. Okay, so uh, uh, those uh, authors had also the, the problem that they need to uh, 
analyzed for the two sectors, but they found insignificant estimates. That the Dossmann paper I was I showed you before, they found that the Czech workers decreased German wages by 0.13%. So it's smaller than what I found, uh, but they found a, a huge uh, displacement uh, effect of one one sex one sec worker for one German worker. Then the the other one for for French, they find also a decrease of French wages between by 1.3 and 2%. So my estimates are more closely to the either ones. And the published paper by Caruso, they found a, a decrease of Colombia wages by 7.6%. That is huge, a huge uh, reduction. Okay, so this is one of the motivations of, of my paper. So find out why this estimate could be so high. And in fact, I find something uh, much, much smaller, but still uh, higher compared to, to the Dustman one. Lucas, just a, yeah. just a clarifying question from Wagner who's asking whether you try to use both instruments at the same time and maybe whether you perform some over identification tests in that case. Yeah, yeah, and if, if I try to use them, both of them, but like the normal over in the identification test, I, I didn't use it because for the over identification test, you must be sure that one of the instruments is totally exogenous I, and I'm not sure in my case. So in this case, because I'm not sure which of them is the truly exogenous one. I cannot say which one is better than the other. I didn't try to, to, to do this kind of, of test. Yeah, and, and if you include them both, do they both remain significant? If, in I, include, if I include them both, the distance instrument take all the variation from the past element. The past element is no longer significant. Okay. So the, the, the distance instrument is, is, is kind of a really explanatory of the migration rate. So it's taking all the power. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, uh, thank you. Okay. And now uh, if I focus on, on employment responses, um, the first thing you note, if you focus on panel A, is that pretrends are, are the flat pretrend test is no longer uh, holding. So uh, this could indicate that uh, the employment, there are pretrends on employment. So what I tried to do is just control, control explicitly for, for the pretrend, as you can see, in, in this panel B, uh, I'm gonna try to explain uh, so you, you cannot be confused. I try to include in the regression explicitly the pretrend. That is the differences between 2013 and 2015 in all the post-year coefficients, okay? And also in the pre-year's pre uh, pre coefficient, pre-treatment period coefficients. And you can see that um, this 2013 by definition uh, is, gonna, is gonna be a zero because I'm including the, the same variable uh, uh, twice. And then what I did is that then the 2014, it seems to be controlled and the estimates uh, seems to be behave better. And what I found is, is the thing I told you that there is a, a delayed negative response. So for wages, if you let me go back, you see that in 2017, you appreciate a negative effect, while for employment, you don't see it, you see it until 2018. So it's a, a delayed uh, negative response one year later. But with these employment results, I'm not so confident because I show in the paper that this, this depends on the inclusion of survey weights to count the employee population because I'm using a survey and that survey has weights to count the employee population. This is sensitive to the inclusion of that. Okay, so um, with the employment results, I'm a little bit cautious, but uh, I'm seeing that there's, there seems to be a negative effect too. Yeah, there, there is another clarifying yeah, question yeah, yeah. from Monica. Uh, who's asking whether what you're showing is basically an average including both formal and informal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the average and then I will try to disentangle both effects. Yeah, great. Uh, and you have uh, 10 minutes, by the way. Oh, okay. Okay, so, whew. okay, so uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump, uh, I'm gonna jump now and I will focus now on the informal, uh, formal uh, distinction. And this is the overall responses for the formal and informal sector. And what you can see is that the formal sector wages are is to have null estimates, while the informal sector wages are decreasing uh, greatly. Okay, so most of the variation of the total wage is coming from the informal sector uh, decrease. And if you focus on employment, so you so you see, you can see that um, uh, formal employment seems to be decreasing in 2018, while informal employment seems to be increasing. Okay, so in here I'm focusing on total market responses, not differentiating on natives and migrants. And why this could happen? Okay, so what I try to, 
too short to explain this. I'm going to be as simple as possible. I'm just going to show supply demand graphs. So, so think there is a two, two informal labor markets with a given, given uh, firms and, and supply. So if you think that the supply shock only affected informal, the informal labor market, as I showed you in the beginning, that the majority of Venezuelans are working on the informal labor market. So that's what I found, that is a decrease in wages while with an increase in employment. Okay, but one puzzle thing is why formal employment should be decreasing. And what I, what if you do the same, you, you, can, you found that there is a minimum wage or a price ceiling that is indicating that wages cannot decrease because there is a, a, a downward rigidity. But what could decrease the employment is a reduction on the, on the demand by the firm. And why this could be this reduction? And I'm, one of my hypotheses is that because informal labor is much cheaper and now formal labor is relatively expensive, so firms are trying to make a, a, a change in the optimal composition of labor and they could change in formal labor for informal labor. And why I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to show this hypothesis is true. I'm gonna focus now on the firm aspect, okay? So <clears throat> I try to differentiate the firms in three types of size, less than five workers, between six and 30 workers and more than 30 workers. And in the, firm, in the, for, in the firms, between six and 30 and less than five workers, you see that formal employment, this is for employment. If I'm going to fast, please, I will try to explain uh, with more details, but this is just formal employment. And you can see that the decrease in formal employment is more present on smaller firms than on larger firms, that one definition or one proxy of definition if the firm is more formal or informal is the size of the firm. So you can see that there's, there seems to be a combination or a change in the, in the portfolio of, of labor from the firm. And if you do the same for informal, for the informal employment, these smaller firms seems to be, they didn't change the informal job. And even if you go to the blue, blue, blue line, it seems to be increasing. Okay, so there's, there is a suggestion that maybe what happens is that because informal labor is cheaper, now firms are trying to hire more informal labor and, and reduce the formal ones that they have. Lucas, yeah. just a quick question. Have you yeah. tried looking, have you looked at the employment of Venezuelans? Because yeah, I mean, yeah. that, that would be the last bit of your story. You would expect these small firms to be increasing their hiring of, of the migrants themselves. And that's kind of your whole story together, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Stephen, that, that's a great question. The problem with, with Venezuelans is that I don't have properly the, the, the sample that I need to do this kind of analysis because in some areas, because I have the, this area analysis in some area, I don't have a lot of Venezuelans. So it's try to hard to disentangle these effects because the, the estimates are going, the standard errors are going to be huge. So that's the reason I didn't focus so much on the migrant population in this paper. But you could use the census to look at employment at least, couldn't you? Yes, yes, I could do that, but then I don't have the, refer the reference Perhaps period. I, okay, no, that's true. That's ta challenging. So it's, it's, yeah, I know, I know that's the next step, but I, I don't, like in this case, I, I cannot have the, the, the data to do that. Okay, so that with that, and then what I what I try to do is, of course, I can also instead of doing a yearly uh, period analysis, I can do a quarterly one, and in this quarterly one, I can do it the same this formal informal distinction for wages, and I can show you that this flat free trend, even if I do by quarters, is the same. And then let me show you something interesting. This this gray dashed line is the reopening of the border. I didn't tell you, but there was a, a closure of the border between Venezuela and, and Colombia. And, and experts say that after the, the border was opening, a lot of Venezuelans come. And this is uh, given by this red, uh, by the, this uh, black line. So you see that this black line is increasing and the estimates, the estimates, this is the wage effects of informal ones are decreasing. Also important, this only by looking is that the relationship, it, it seems to be non-monotonic, okay? So you don't see that if migrants are increasing more in size, the estimates are getting worse, okay? So the estimates are getting worse, but they are like a steady worse, okay? And for formal ones, you see that the estimates are seems to be in, insignificant. Okay, so this, this type of event studies is, is also a complement to the paper and also have some heterogeneous effects. I don't know if I have time. Is that how am I on time? Uh, you have another five minutes. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Okay, so uh, in this, uh, these heterogeneous effects, now I'm focusing in, in, in the type of, of skill of the worker measured by the level of educational achievement. And as you expect, uh, workers who are uh, less educated, 
had the, the biggest wage and employment effect. This is just the difference between 2018 and 2015. Instead of showing the, the event study graph, I'm just focusing on the 2018 coefficient as I show you how it be, behaved the pretreatment period. Okay, so there is a, a negative effect on wages and employment, and, and this is consistent what, what you can expect because also informal workers, the majority are, are non-educated, okay? And then uh, the last thing I, I wanted to show you is, is these wage effects by industry. Okay, so in here I have in the, in the x-axis the predicted share of employed Venezuelans, and in the uh, y-axis I have the, the effect on native wages. And you can see that where most Venezuelans are working, you see the, you see the highest effect, the highest negative effect on wages. And for that reason, you find that uh, construction, commerce, and manufacturing, where the majority of Venezuelans are working, you, you see the, the highest uh, or the negative wage effect. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna try to summarize all, all what I, I found. So this paper analyzes the impact of the Venezuelan mass migration on the Colombian labor market. As I showed to you, I estimate a negative effect on native hourly wages of between 1.6 and 1.7% for a one percentage point increase in the share of employed Venezuelans. This is in line with the negative findings I show you by Caruso, but they are much smaller on, on size. And these, these findings are different from the null estimates by the two unpublished papers. Okay, so I try to uh, see what kind of the difference could arise. And the differences are mainly from the empirical specification. As I told you, they use a, a pooled uh, IV regression. Also the definition of migration rate uh, some of them use the log of, 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 of migration. And I, in here, I'm using just the, a basic rate and also the amount of periods analyzed. And this is important because I, as I have shown you, the relation seems to be non-monotonic in the sense that more, more migrants coming in terms of magnitude doesn't imply that the estimates are getting worse. Okay, so uh, some of these papers use less information than I use. Okay, so these are the kind of, of, of things I found to be to be uh, different. Uh, as I told you, there is a, a, an, an impact on native employment that appears to have to be delayed. Okay, so the employment effect seems to start in 2018 while the wage effect seems to start in 2017. And on aggregate, the influx of Venezuelans increased informal employment and decreased informal wages while having an insignificant effect on formal wages. And I try to explain with these simple supply demand graphs that the, this could be first by the minimum wage and the other because the degree of flexibility in the formal sector. Okay, I have more results and robustness checks. If I have time, I don't know. Uh, very little time. So if you want to just show your favorite one, maybe. Okay. <laughs> you have like one or two minutes. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, as I told you, the, the, this past settlement instrument, if I use different shares from 2005, 1993 or 1973, this is the effect on native wages. It seems to be pretty similar. Okay, it doesn't change a lot. And the also is this distance instrument, I include in the regression trade with Venezuela, because as you know, this distance instrument is predicting that more migrants come to areas that could be more affected with the Venezuelan crisis in terms of trade shocks or different kind of business interactions. And when I include them, the estimates doesn't change a lot. And this seems to be like a, a robustness, an important robustness test for the findings of the distance instrument. Okay, so I'm, I'm not gonna... Okay, and the, the last one and the last one is what happens when I include more pretense periods because I think this is also important. And what I did is um, include two more years and then you can see, for instance, for wages, in 2018, the estimates uh, get quite high, but importantly for me, are kind of stable in the, in the last three per treatment uh, years. While for employment, you see that uh, it gets back to, to the flat return and it seems to be not that employment in the different areas have structural differences, but are just fluctuations on time that are kind of good also for the employment estimate. Okay, so uh, with that, I think, I think I'm done. Great, well, thank you very much, Lucas, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, if the audience has questions, you can raise your hand. Maybe we can start with Monica, who had some questions in the chat, and then Marta, who has okay. also his, his uh, hand raised. So <laughs> great, great. Monica, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? You should be able to unmute yourself um, if you want. 
I'm sorry, it's just a uh, contraction in my house, so that's why I was writing the question. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I hear you. I hear you. Answer. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but my question. Let me. Let me. Now that I muted myself, um, uh, uh, read it. So, um, as a historic with this historical migration with Venezuelans in Colombia, there is a lot of uh, of the dynamic happening in six departments. I mean, um, so we concentrate on the La Guajira, maybe. Yeah. Um, maybe not Cúcuta, and then newly close to um, Amazon, Amazon and. Uh, south of um, Barinas and on that area in Venezuela, and yeah. then maybe some um, Bogota. So I was wondering if you ever did like some kind of task of just looking at those areas without including, especially those areas that do not have so much of a long history of migration patterns. This, in my in my case, we go in deeper into the reverse uh, regional migration, okay. given the history, historical connection that Colombians and Venezuelans have had in the opposite direction, where yeah, yeah, yeah. many yeah. of the settlements that you call 1973 and 1990s and 2000, even 2005, are likely to be areas where Colombians from those areas were, were uh, migrated to Venezuela. So, uh, so the, the the networks that we're looking at are different and not necessarily the migrant networks that we normally have in our mind, but more uh, uh, coming back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So it's, it, I don't know if I, I follow you uh, very correctly, but I think, um, first of all, in my analysis, I only have like 24 departments. So restricting uh, data is, is kind of sensible for my analysis. In here, I'm going to show you a graph. What, what I did is, is do the, the same analysis, but take away one of these border departments that we think that might be uh, leading these estimates. And when I, I take it away, the estimate seems to be kind of fine. But of course, um, when you go to deeper details, uh, it's, it's, there can be a lot of things going on, okay? so. This reverse migration is true, especially for the for the last historical shares that I used. That's that's the reason I'm I'm taking more 2005. That you know after 2002 when when Chavez won, a lot of Venezuelans started to go back to Colombia. So I think we have a a, a, a network of Venezuelans in 2005. That's the reason I also focus on the 2005 one. Uh, but yeah, this is the test I did, like restricting only the border departments that see if maybe they they change the results. Uh, yeah. Great. So now, um, Marta had allowed you to unmute yourself, so you can go ahead. Thank you, and um, thank you for this presentation. It's been very useful, the research. Um, I just had a question first regarding the uh, results on the increase on formalization as a result of uh, of, of Venezuelan. Uh, sorry, I, as, as an increase on the informal employment as a result of yeah, yeah. Uh, Venezuelan. Uh, uh, integration in the labor market. So I was yeah. like trying to uh, understand a little bit what were the causes of this increase in informal employment. And then the other question I had was uh, just like a scenario, if there was an increase of formalization uh, among Venezuelans, what are the potential effects on, on formal wages that you could uh, think of? Okay. okay, so I will start with the second one. So there is a, a paper, a that already study what's the effect of the formalization of all the migrant workers because in 2018 the government of Colombia did like a huge amnesty program and almost all Venezuelans could get uh, access to to visa work to uh, visas for work and they found null effects in in in, in some of the outcomes okay so i don't think how it's clear that with this amnesty program you could reach uh, different uh, formal wage effects but uh, it's something that those authors find that there's a, there's no effect. So in my in my case, I, I don't think there's a, a confoundness a confoundedness with this policy. And with the, the first question, like I, I can only think in terms of of of, of uh, so the supply and demand graph. So why I think that the informal uh, labor market increase, and I, I'm just gonna show you this supply and demand graph. So I think because there is a the supply shock, more people are coming, more Venezuelans are coming. This informal employment increase is just from Venezuelans being 
uh, absorb in this in this labor market. So it's like just a uh, supply supply uh, entrance in in this in this market. So I don't know the, the causes causes by itself. It's it's the way I think. Uh, good. So if uh, nobody else has questions, if you do, please uh, raise your virtual hand. Uh, otherwise, yeah. I may I may go ahead with the question myself. So yeah, if yeah. I understand correctly, these results that you're showing are, are, are really the overall effect by regions. Yeah. yeah. If you would uh, distinguish between high and low skill, for instance, uh, do you maybe see a complementarity effect with high skill native? Or, that's, or not at that, all. Yeah, that's the thing that is still puzzling to me because I only find a, a like the usual negative effect on on low skill, but not entirely a complementary effect on 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 high skill. So it's something I as I show you in the heterogeneous ones. So so there is like a the negative effect on low skill and and the and there is non effect on on high skill measured by lows by educational achievement. But then, if I if I divide low skill, high skill by formal, informal, things get a little a little bit messy because what's a formal a low skill and only by the educational achievement? So I think there are more things going on, and the data requirements because this is a survey is not like getting me letting me the, the power to analyze that. Yeah. But I think yeah, it's still uh, I think it's something good to to analyze with more detail. I I'm gonna put it. There. Any other questions from the audience? If, if I have time, I can show you one more result that I, I didn't have time. Sure, I guess you can, you can go okay, ahead with okay, your last yeah, result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the last thing I, I wanted to, to show to you is that I also did the analysis not only a focusing on the mean, like not the average wage, but a different part of the wage distribution, okay? So if you focus on the different wage distribution in each local area, I can, I can, I can see the, the effect uh, depending on the percentile, okay? So if, if you go in here, this blue line is the effect on the 25th percentile of the native local wage distribution. This red one is the median, and this green one is the 90th percentile. So this is very interesting because what, it, what this is, a, showing us is that wages located in the lower part of the distribution seems to be more affected by this migration event, while the ones that are more in the upper part seems to be almost uh, non-significant. Of course, this is this also is capturing, again, uh, informal workers can be in the lower part or low skill workers can be in the lower part, but it's also interesting to see how these, these patterns work. And, and, and that's the thing I just also wanted to show you. Good. I guess we're we're um, at the end of our time. So if you can okay. just unshare your screen so that Yashna yeah. can just uh, conclude. Okay. So yeah. Thank you, everyone. And any more questions or or anything, just write me an email, and I'm open to discussions or everything. I, I for everything. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Lucas, for a really nice presentation today. Um, so let me just quickly. Uh, announced the presentation of next week on February 1st. We'll have Chem Osluzel uh, that's going to present his paper on the cautioning effect of immigration policy, immigrant mobility, sorry, uh, evidence from the Great Recession in Spain. So we are really looking forward to have you all there uh, next week at the same time. Um, so you can have all the upcoming presentations. You can see them again on our website. So the videos of past presentations are up on our website. And as you know, we, we uh, review papers on a rolling basis, so do not hesitate to keep sending us uh, your papers if you would like to present in, in our seminar. Uh, as you've seen today as well, um, you can also sign up as a panelist to interact more uh, with the speaker, and you can also interrupt and ask questions during the presentation. The only thing we ask of panelists is to have read the paper in advance and to register before Friday so that we can set up uh, uh, better and join the seminar five minutes before the start so that we can promote you to panelists. So we're really happy to have had you all here today. And thank you again, Lucas, for uh, such thank a you. nice presentation. <laughs> See you ne next week. Thanks to you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.